Hello and welcome to episode six of the My Life in Rugby interview series as we begin our week-long previews to the 2024 Guinness Women's Six Nations Championship with the first of our two marquee interviews of the week. Joining me today is a former Munster in Ireland back row who made a name for herself as an abrasive figure in an early Irish side. Since then, she's pushed on to play club rugby in England and France while also getting the honour of representing the Barbarians. Joining me to look back on her career in the game is fan favourite Anna Kappas. Welcome to the show, Anna. Thanks very much for having me. How are you? I'm good. I'm fine. I'm enjoying the, the men's six nations while it's on now and the, the women's six nations around the corner. That means European rugby is around the corner. So it's always a good time of year, at least. I know. I totally agree, especially kind of after Christmas when you're, you know, trying to get over like the winter blues. Next thing you're just hit with this like train of rugby, like this time every year. I absolutely love it. Absolutely. It's it's never a bad thing to have that, especially you know, fine weather rugby. We don't get a lot of it in this country, so any sign of it is always a good sign. Um, I usually try to start these things on a lighter note, Anna. So my first question has to be your background of playing the ukulele, because we've seen on your Instagram with a parody song of Jocks or Goes to Stuttgart from the last World Cup. Where did you learn to play the ukulele and what, what was the idea behind it? Let's just write a tune. Yeah, that song. Oh, it actually depresses me now because I was I had so much fun writing it and I like I put it on my Instagram like must have been I'd say it was the Friday night before we played the quarter final. And then like losing the quarter final the next day. I actually it was such a high cuz it's so much fun like writing the song and recording the song like I love Christy Moore and uh do you know, I just felt like the Irish team was in such a good place. I felt like it was kind of a time for a, a bit of a joxer comeback. <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah, I get sad now. Like, even I listened back to it there the other day and I was like, oh, my God, the World Cup was so brilliant up till the final whistle or maybe a few minutes before the final whistle that day. And, like, that song just kind of... Uh, summarize it but actually to, to answer your question about the ukulele we actually have Nora Stapleton to blame for that because um Nora like she you know she got 50 caps for Ireland uh in the World Cup I actually I met her only recently and I was talking to her about it and uh yeah she said I was just chatting to her in camp one day uh in the same summer as we were p- preparing for the World Cup in 2017 I said I get a bit Uh, antsy like I kind of feel like I need to learn a new skill maybe I'll learn the ukulele and she was like I have a ukulele at home you can have it (laughs) and that was the start of that so we actually have Nora Stapleton to blame for for that for all the uh all the the the, the songs the ukulele songs we've had a couple of um in-camp antics being referenced in the series so far but I think learn the ukulele from one of Ireland's great players is probably it's it's a league of its own in its own regard. Like you can kind of expect the AIL stories and things like that. But what do you do before a World Cup? I'll pick up something new. Is I mean, why not? <laughs> like you know. Yeah, I know. But it's it's good to be to be learning new things. They kind of the, I suppose the other side of it was that like, and we'll get into this a bit more. You know, as as we talk a bit more about uh like my career and stuff. But like I studied languages and I always kind of viewed myself as being like going away to play abroad and I wanted to play in so many different countries and because I love travel and I love living abroad and you know hence why I studied languages and the the year I was you know selected to play in, in the World Cup I actually was thinking about moving to Japan that year and I was like no 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 I'm in the Irish squad now I'll, I'll stick around a while and I'll just learn some new things to keep me occupied. And ukulele was one of them. So that's actually why. <laughs> there's there's no harm in, in new challenges, that's for sure. And we will get into the World Cup later on because obviously it's it's hard to believe it's seven years ago now. But, you know, it feels like no length ago that we were really preparing for this big showpiece. But one thing that always interests me is kind of like the pathways, the non-typical routes. So like we've been lucky, we've talked about AIL um twice over at this stage. It'll this probably get it to about three or four times. We talked about Curry Cup. We talked about Mitre Ten. So, what's your first kind of memories of of following rugby and and playing rugby? And was it always the sport that stood out that you, that you wanted to go and and pursue or to play? Um, I grew up in a very sporty household. I actually, from a very young age, and this came from like primary school. You know, in primary school, soccer is so easy to play because all you need is the ball, and then you throw down two jumpers 
for the goalposts and then that's it it's all you need you know whereas for rugby it's a bit more complex and everything so like you know soccer is the is the sport that's played in every every um every schoolyard and like especially with the girls and the boys we played together and I always when I was that age I always thought I'd play soccer for Ireland and I always wanted to play soccer for Ireland but like when in secondary school there wasn't the chance to play either sport like there was no soccer team or no rugby team so I continued with tennis and golf and GAA which were the sports I was doing anyway but uh when it was like when Munster kind of I started following Munster from around 2000 um you know in the start of the kind of the wonder years in Munster like that's really what like changed my real like yearning to play soccer to play rugby and uh I never really I never I never asked about it I never I used to be pushing for a soccer team in school but I never pushed for rugby because I just thought it was just too much for someone to take on in terms of a coach um and I'd never played it myself I always was like I can't wait to get to college to play rugby that's what I used to think I never thought that I'd get the opportunity to play underage but sure enough like one day in school like they just announced in the intercom that there was going to be a rugby training that night and like everyone in the everyone in the classroom turned and looked at me because they all knew that I was like obsessed with monster and rugby and they knew that i'd want to play and like that was that was a friday i heard the announcement on the friday and went down to training that night and like never ever looked back like it just it changed my life like from that moment i just had found and not that i felt like i was looking for it i was very happy with the sports i was playing but like maybe it just found me like i remember after the training session like this is down in mallow town park we were covered in muck and like I was singing in the shower afterwards at the top of my lungs, singing in the fields of Athen right. And then I like just kind of caught myself and I was like, Jesus, I didn't realize I was singing there so loudly. But I had just been like kind of thrown into an extra level of of just total euphoria for play after playing rugby for the first time. So um that strangely meant that when I got to college and I, you know, I I, I went to UL and even before I got to UL, I had already been training with the Munster senior squad. Like I was one of the only girls on the team who had started at 17. I was actually considered one of the young starters. It sounds so crazy now, you know, yeah. when, you know, like underage rugby has like picked up so much. 17 sounds so late, but actually in those days, 17 meant I had two years of underage rugby before getting to senior level which meant that you know I already knew the rules for example or I already had the concept of passing backwards because like at you know in UL and every AIL club at that stage girls were coming across from college maybe or they were just coming into it brand new only having watched it from the telly so that was my pathway which actually seemed to be a kind of a you know it was the very kind of early stages of underage girls rugby in Ireland yeah, it's mad to compare it to now because you look at now there's non-traditional clubs and that's one thing the women's game has on the men's is there is more players from the non-traditional clubs than the men's side and it's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant because I know my own club like we've had okay like Banislow is is known for rugby but like to have someone like Dayton Parsons come through and be a star but she's one of three internationals in the Six Asian squad this year like that's incredible I know it's the same down in Cork and you know, I think Tipperary is, is in there and there's, you know, Galway, there's Mayo, there's loads of different areas. And it's brilliant to see because it's, but it, it highlights how much it's changed in, in such a short period of time as well. And like you would have played, you mentioned underage systems, you would have mentioned AIL there with, with UL Bowes who are, who are doing all right at the moment as well. Mm. How do you think it shapes up from, from then and to now and the kind of improvements or, or lack thereof in certain positions because, you came through the All Ireland League level. It's it's a great system if it's done right. Goodness, yeah. Like I always got asked this question because I I moved to England to play, and that was part of my. Do you know the AAL will always be like so very close to my heart and closer than any other league to my heart. I know I've played in the Premiership and I'm playing now in France or whatever, but the AAL, like I'll stand by the AAL f- forever because that's what 
that's what taught me the game, you know, and despite the underage, you know, like um, pathway and opportunity I had, like the AIL was where I learned and I was just very lucky to be, to have gone to UL and played for UL Bows who were just phenomenal. And like the the, the most difficult thing to, to for me now is that the AIL seems to be kind of um, similar to what's happened, you know, in the men's game. The AIL is kind of like becoming shunned a little bit. But I actually think that the AIL is the opportunity to achieve the same level of rugby as what they have achieved in the premiership. And people would think I'm crazy for doing that, for saying that. But the reason I believe it is because the AIL used to be just as good, if not better than what the premiership was. Because I went from UL over to to St. Mary's to do a H-dip um, in Twickenham in London. And I joined Richmond and everyone always asked me, oh, what's it like? What's it like? Is it way better? And I was always so confused about what answer I should give because I felt like people were expecting me to say like, yeah, it's, it's way better. Do you know, yeah. it's England. And, you know, everyone talks about England or the English women's team are strong. And honestly, it was nowhere near as good as what we had, what we had in New Elbows. Nowhere near it. And I was always so confused about what answer I should give. Now, when I say nowhere near, um, what I mean about that is that we had a UL Bowes Academy with myself and a number of other girls in who were getting specialized training in the morning in the gym before going to college. And that wasn't happening for women's rugby players at the time. I know it happened for one player down in UCC. It started to happen gradually over time that women's players were being given access to the gym. It wasn't happening in the premiership in England at the time. And um, th that's why the current conversation around the AIL and how, you know, games are getting cancelled and, um, you know, this this talk of like the, you know, putting our investment into the provinces, that's very difficult. Like we had it, the formula already existed in the AIL. It already exists still in the AIL. And I just I'd love to see us be ambitious and achieve like a level of rugby in the AIL that is similar to what is produced in the premiership in England. And it's it's Good that we're touching it from this angle as well, because the AIL is not in the public conversation generally. Like it's just looked over. And I I it annoys me sometimes when the IR seems to be at sevens. Like sevens is its own pathway and it's brilliant. I know you've played it and I can absolutely see why people would enjoy it. Like if you're young, you're traveling the world with a group of mates. But like the AIL, as you said, there is a pathway there that can be built on. And if you look at the Celtic Challenge is currently ongoing as we record, that could be brilliant. But what if that was UL Bowes and Black Rock and Railway and, you know, whoever, maybe a team from the north instead of, you know, Wolfhounds and Clovers and no disrespect to them. But mm. like, we've literally just made them up out of thin air when we could have had generations of kind of history to fall back on before we even get in the door and into a new competition. Yeah. And I don't, I don't see why we're kind of, involving Scottish and Welsh rugby when it's not their top players. Yeah. You know, the top players in Wales, like pretty much the entire Welsh squad plays in the premiership. Same in Scotland. Um, but our, you know, a handful of our players are in the premiership and then the rest are playing in the Celtic Challenge Cup. Like it's not um it's 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 a bit imbalanced, especially for how how ambitious we need to be. Um if we want to catch up with the other nations and you know the the question i'm i'm talking about you know achieving a league that's going to be something you know similar that you could compare to the premiership but like at this stage we, what we're looking to do is beat teams like italy and scotland do you know that's the first step and i just don't see why you know the celtic challenge has it doesn't have the players in it that are the top quality that we're going to be coming up against in the six nations yeah, and that's something that I know fans were looking at when the squads were named as well. They were like, well, you know, Scotland, for instance, were using as a developmental squad. And and that's, if you want to do that, fair enough, and, and let them do it. It's like, then why are we having, you know, 40 cap internationals in our squads who are kind of just there, but not playing, but there for experience? It's like, could they not go in and coach? Or, you know, maybe just play in one game. And like, there was these conversations. These conversations always seem to come back around. And 
we might yeah. like we're going to touch on the Six Nations kind of at the end of the show, so we might come back to it because yeah, I mentioned sevens there, and I do want to talk about that because I'm a big advocate of sevens. The you know the men's and women's have qualified for the Olympics this year. What was your experience of it, and and did you enjoy it? Yeah, I absolutely adore sevens, um, and I think it's a brilliant, uh, a brilliant path. No, sorry, I'm not going to say pathway. It's a brilliant sport. Full stop. Yeah. And not to be used as a pathway. Like, obviously, there are athletes who can cross over. And I even read the other day about kind of like the player pool in Ireland um, just not being, sorry, not even the player pool. Someone wrote about the population of Ireland just not being big enough to feed um, a good Irish women's 15 squad. She didn't even mention the seven squad. This person was like, well, hang on a second. Look at how successful our men's team are. And how successful the men's sevens team is. And, you know, schools, rugby, AIL rugby, like provincial rugby as well, like using population as an argument is absolutely stupid because obviously we have the population to feed all of these teams and to be number one in the world. So it's the same population we're we're choosing from here. It's about like the opportunities that are presented for players. What also works me is the the conversation around the fact that there weren't enough, there aren't enough players to feed both 15s and 7s squads. There are. Easy as that. There are. Only the opportunities were only given to a handful. The kind of difficult thing around it is that because there was investment in 7s, which came from you know, the Olympic Council and things like that, any young player who was showing potential was put into 7s. And, you know, rightly so, like you, 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 if you have a team that has money behind it and has an opportunity, you know, go get those players. But players didn't have a choice. It's not like the players could turn around and be like, no, I'll stay in 15s because I, because that's what I prefer. You had to go to sevens because that was the only option. Maybe you would have chosen it anyway. And maybe some players would have chosen it anyway, but it's not the case for all the players and how slow the investment now has been in 15s and offering like full-time contracts. Of course, everyone would go to sevens. And thankfully, like, you know, given where they've got to now and what they've achieved and like, ugh, they could really medal at this world, at this, at this Olympics this summer. And, and I hope they do because they've been a long time, you know, kind of like battling it out, always the bridesmaids, but like, I really, I, I love it. And like, I think the, nar- the, nar- the narrative all, over the last few years was kind of, pipping 15s and 7s against each other stupid it shouldn't be the way there are enough players for both squads and for both squads to be like backing each other and if there are crossover athletes like that's that's brilliant as well but how it's been managed in the last few years has been uh just there it didn't work and it it uh has worked now for the seven squad or didn't work for the 15 squad and it's you know now with how it's been managed we look at where 15s is and where sevens is Oh, I'd agree. And I did, you know, I did find some of that conversation a bit draining. The fact that like it was pitting one against the other. It's like, well, they're not the same sport, first of all. And like the age profile of the 15s team was younger by choice of the coaches. So like the fact that there was younger players going off playing sevens is more of an anomaly, more than that. So usually you'd have the younger players playing sevens. And, you know, I, I think it's some of them on it. And like, that's their opportunity. That might be their only opportunity to travel and to play sport. Not everyone gets it, you know, and it's it's great it's that they had it. And like yeah. to pit it against each other, I just never understood. And now we're in Olympics here and it's almost come full circle where we're questioning why are some of the sevens players the succession squad when they weren't allowed last year, when they're vying for qualification. It's it's one of those things where you're just sitting there and you don't know what's going on. And I, like, again, we'll, we'll talk about the Six Nations later because I do want to get into that heavily enough. But mm. another thing that was brought up recently, and I know... Fiona Hayes was one of the ones to kind of um say nothing but saying a lot in in yeah. some ways I suppose about selection because interpros were generally when you were playing a huge you know part of the selection process and how you got into the Ireland squad and it's still a great tournament but unfortunately there's there's an idea now that it does not reflect in selection. What was your experience like when you when you did play the interpros because I know there was some all time Irish great players playing when you when you were involved in the competition. But do you think, again, kind of like the AIL that you touched on, it was the right way to go? And now it's probably steered away from it. Um, 
I absolutely adored playing for Munster and everyone adores playing for their province because of the honour and because of, you know, getting to link up with girls from other clubs. But it wasn't always easy. It was like a lot of travel during the week. Um, a lot, a lot, a huge commitment um, from all the players and the management. And sometimes it just didn't transfer onto the field then because we were going, you know, between AIL games and then you have your window closed off and you suddenly have to change all your line out calls and your backs calls. And, you know, it's a... Uh, didn't always produce the level of rugby that it kind of should have on paper. Like we were definitely playing better rugby in UL Bowes than we were in Munster. Um, you know, which actually makes sense sometimes as well that, you know, when you're in yeah. your club, you just kind of click it a little bit better. Um, and I, I'd love to see that um, managed a little bit better. I'm not, I don't even know what, what the answer is because you're still going to have to have travel involved. That's the biggest thing. Cause it's very draining for people who are also working full time. Now that we're getting more and more full time players, it might uh, make it a bit more sense, but up to now it's been, it hasn't always been the easiest format. Um, but uh, especially, do you know when we're including like players who live in Kerry in that, um, mm. But when it came to especially last year's selection when Munster had won the Interpros and there were so few Munster players involved, I was I was shocked. I was devastated. I was just like, I don't get this. Like I don't I don't get it. You know, the, people would often say, Oh, sure, they're only picking players that live in Dublin. And with all my heart, I wanted to be like, there's no way they could do that. And then you turn around and you see the players and you're like, Oh my God. Are they right? Is that true? Is that is that what they're doing? But um, again, like it would have, I didn't watch as much. I didn't see as much rugby this year in the interpros as I did last year, um, because of being away and all the rest. But um, again, a similar pattern. And I I know that when Leinster won the interpros this year, a part of me was like, oh, is our argument gone now? for yeah. when the when the selection comes out and it's all Leinster players are we going to be saying oh but sure they won but it didn't work that conversation that point didn't work last year I don't know I don't I think I think I didn't see enough of the interpros in detail to make a good comment this year but I know that last year I was devastated for the Munster players who I felt really deserved to be in the Irish squad and the the point I mentioned Fiona Hayes comments um or very little words but you know what I mean but she's with you elbows and they are top of the league by I think it's like eight points or something like that with a couple of games to go when she's kind of hinting at well why isn't there more UL Bowls players there's only one in the regular squad then that's exactly the point that we made last year it's just from a different angle it was Interpros now it's something else and I, I suppose as you said it probably wasn't the best competition you know to look at because it is only you know three or four games and like as you said you're you're literally just coming together to play three games it's hard to build the connections but to be fair the likes of TG Carr have pushed on and broadcasted and you know I think BBC iPlayer carried Ulster's home games this year and the fact that it's getting to more eyes is always a good sign though as well I think you'd agree with that and the AIL is getting to more eyes because you know you mentioned your school didn't have rugby well if you're able to watch these teams on, you know, these girls on TG Car or whatever, that's probably something that you can fall back on and probably take some enjoyment out of, I suppose. Yeah, and definitely, like, you know, if it was me, and, you know, the, the fact that I never asked the question about can we have a women's, can we have a girls rugby team, if I'd seen a match on TG Car, I know for a fact I would have asked the question. Do you know, because it just it just wasn't visible, you know, and I, I would have maybe watched on a Sunday and gone in on the Monday and picked out whichever teacher I thought might be interested in being like, hey, you know, that's that's what that will do. Um, But to go back to the point about like, I do think the standard of the Interpros has gotten better from when I played in it. So, you know, I do think it's it's pushed on a bit in terms of uh, uh the level and like, you know, the, the coverage and the the. um helps that because you know you you can't be you can't be experimenting you can't be trying things like you have to just you, you know the 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 enjoyment of women's rugby is on the line there as well like you have to perform well um as well as you know if it's on if it's on tv then you know that the irish coaches even if they're 
in in attendance or not like they have the footage immediately they'll be watching that like so I don't know I I I I don't know. There's always questions. It doesn't matter where you're from. Any club is going to be biased towards their own players because they see what their own players put in week in, week out. So it's hard for me in the outside to comment on that. I completely understand where Fiona Hayes is coming from because uh, UL Bowes are doing really well. And then, you know, not enough players are are picked. But I remember, I remember that feeling like of playing for Bowes and having no fear of anybody anyone opposite any team any player and then when I got called into Irish camp I was so scared like that you know how good you are for your club doesn't always transcend into how well you then perform when you're in that environment personally I remember that really really profoundly like playing on a Saturday or playing on a Sunday versus you know a team and and other back rows that were being talked about and having no problem with performing against them. And in lots of cases, I felt like I played better than them. And then when I got into camp, I couldn't do it. I was just too scared. It's very strange, like kind of psychology that, you know, I don't know if some players battle with that. I know I certainly did. So um, it's always lots of questions that can be asked and it's important to keep asking them as well. Yeah, I suppose the, the only way you'll improve is by looking back. And I know there's a lot of people... And I've kind of called this out in my own coverage about, like, say, the men's World Cup, and they said, oh, no, we were fine. It's like, well, let's improve the two or three things that we weren't fine at, and that would be even better. And like, that's my outlook on women's rugby as well. Prove the things that are weaknesses and keep going and staying with all sports, like, does not matter. And I think, you know, that's an important side to look at. And we'll touch on Ireland because I know, you know, you, you won well, it was 16 caps. I don't have it here in front of me at the moment, but... <laughs> For Ireland, um, the first of which in 2016, which probably feels like no length ago, your first cap was Angela by the late Tom Tierney. Do you want to just describe your relationship with with Tom when when he was Ireland coach? God, yeah, and it still feels so strange to say the late Tom Tierney because he, you know, he was such a character and so, you know, so full of life and just such a, uh, you know, charismatic individual. Like even as a coach, um. And I remember, yeah, I remember really well the phone call I got from him and and uh, how kind he was and encouraging he was. And he was, you know, just, you know, go for it now. And, and, and I think he could see that side that I was just talking about, you know, this whole kind of like playing for bows and being 10 feet tall and then coming into camp and feeling two feet tall. Like, I think he, he spoke to me a little bit about that and was like, you know, you 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 are better than, than what you think. And you're better than, you know, what, um, yeah, you know, yeah, you're, you're a really good player and I'm going to back you in this. So like, I remember that really, really well. Um, sadly with our relationship with Tom, like was, was tested hugely, like coming into that world cup and throughout that world cup. So it's, a, it's really sad that it ended the way it did with Tom as, as our, as our coach. Um, I remember really well, um, before the world cup, he did, a he was being assessed and he kind of called us all into a meeting. This is when this, the summer before the, the world cup, the summer of 2017, and we were training so hard and uh, I remember Tom used to come around to all the different provinces and do skill sessions with us. And they were great crack. Oh, my God. Like, it'd be a gorgeous summer evening. You'd be out in, in UL Bowes. And then uh, if you were off, you might drive up to Galway then and do the skill session up there to see Tom and then to Dublin. And we'd have, be having great crack. It was a brilliant, brilliant summer of training. And he was being assessed and he brought us all into a meeting room and he was like, girls, just to let you know who these people are that are around watching and with the clipboards, you know, I'm being assessed and I want to be like the best coach I can for this group of players. And I'm going to put everything into it. And I promise like, I'm going to give it everything, give it my all. And that means, you know, me being assessed means I'll, you know, be getting feedback and I want to improve. And it was really honest. And I remember him, him, sitting at the table and I remember like just you could hear a pin drop in the room because he was being very vulnerable in that that moment like telling us about this and um sadly again it it, it developed the, the way it did 
because of just because of numerous of the things of no, no fault of the players or no fault of the managers like it was just uh, it was just how it unraveled and literally unraveled for us and it's I just jump into the, the World Cup because like it, it was disappointing but like there's no point you know moving around that but like there is that honour but I suppose it's easy like at the time there was this crest of excitement and fair enough because like Grand Slam Champions 2013 World Cup finalists 2014, um, six Nations champions in 2015, I think. Yeah, yeah, 2015. Like, yes, there's reason for great excitement, but it literally was just such a steep rise that there was probably a level of pressure that you weren't used to as well. Because as much as I, I think it's it's Tom Savage wrote about this about Tom and Park, as much as playing in these cauldrons can lift you, it can also be a weight as well. And probably there was an element of that in the World Cup, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, I remember the journey of it. Like the the first game was Australia and it was a really tough game. And uh, it was, uh, we won and it was a good game, but it was the first game in the opening game. I remember um, <laughs> we were staying in UCD and uh, the weird thing about staying in UCD is we had actually stayed there earlier in the summer. So we got to kind of experience what it was like to stay there. One thing that really bothered me about where we were staying is that we had individual rooms. And I know that like sharing your room for someone for the duration of a world cup can be, can be tough, but I actually found an individual room really stressful because I always thought I was like late for something or, or whatever. And, and so I bought myself a little, um, alarm clock with a radio and it shone the, the time on the roof of the or on the ceiling of my room so if I woke up being like oh my god I'm late I could just <laughs> like lie there and see the time and I'd be like oh no Anna it's only like three o'clock in the morning you're fine <laughs> so that was also a radio and I remember the radio going off one morning like oh, sorry one morning it was the morning directly after we had beaten Australia and I remember I actually think it was um, Tracy Clifford for two FM presenter who's or no sorry Jennifer Zamparelli whatever her name used to be she was like it came on and she was saying bandwagon 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 singing a song about a bandwagon and I was like is she talking about us and she was like all aboard the bandwagon and I just turned it up and she was like oh my god Ireland women beat Australia last night. Um, this is great. We're all aboard the banner. And I couldn't believe it uh, that she was talking about it. And also I was like, <laughs> what the hell? Anyway, <laughs> it's just one of my memories of like the excitement that started to pick up from that first game, which started to wane after the second game when we only barely beat Japan, um, who were like incredibly tough because we'd had a two test series versus them. Um, Oh, sorry. They weren't test games at all. They were they were practice games earlier in the summer and they were tough, tough team, like very strong, very low center of gravity. They were drilled so well. And then when it came to the World Cup, we only barely beat them. So at that stage, it was starting to get tough. And then in the third game, we lost to France. And uh, exactly like you're saying, you know, the the kind of the pressure can go one way or the other. And very quickly, even after that first hit of like winning the opening game versus Australia. Um, yeah, it just it went downhill very, very quickly for us. And it's funny too, because one thing that gets talked about every time there's a World Cup is where, who you play and when. And like beating Australia does bring that kind of huge boost, as you imagine, on the opening day and then you hit that Japan game. But it's easy to remember that France were, I don't know what the exact rank is, where they were top four, if not top five side in the world at the time they're like they were one of the contenders along with yourselves so like that there's probably that element of getting caught in it and kind of forgetting that they're a very good team and then you know that there's probably a sense of deflation that kicks in but when you played them and I know there's kind of that shorter turnaround into the knockouts then did you sense that there was a little bit of a hangover kind of kicking in because again it is that short turnaround between games no because I actually think we had the beatings of them um, but we were rattled by their mall defense. We would have backed our mall a lot, and we got a lot of uh, we won a lot of ground of off our mall and scored a lot of tries from our mall. Um, because you know, we had Mazzy Riley as a line out jumper, and she, you know, she was such a huge threat and her height and everything, and our line out was so strong. 
the mall was the second part of that and they stood off the mall so we right. couldn't advance I remember just this moment of like the Irish mall was set up but they can't move forward the French defenders are standing off if they move forward into it then it, it's it's game on and it was just this moment of like everyone looking at the referee and the ref being like I don't know and that was a very strange moment because the players I, I, I wasn't involved in, in, in that game at this point the French game I hadn't played a minute of rugby. I was on the bench for Japan and didn't get on. So for me personally, it was very, very tough to be there. But that um, that moment of like panic, what what are we going to do without our mall? And there was kind of, there was no, um, there was no help. There was no nothing. They were literally, the players were kind of at sea and didn't know how to resolve it. And then France just, you know, played really well. And I don't think we would have underestimated France but I do think we we definitely had the beatings of them. I um, can't remember if we'd beaten them in the Six Nations just prior, um, but we had beaten them in you know in recent um, in recent fixtures with them. So um, it wasn't uh, we did feel like it was a game that we could have won, um, but it just it fell apart. Yeah, and, and it's a pity because you know there's only that opportunity once. So I suppose on the flip side is if you know if our if the current women's team gets the World Cup next year or 2025, 20, yeah, that, that is next year, I suppose, even though it's a, it's a while away, but yeah. it, it's in England and it's almost going to feel like a home one again because I know ticket sales are, are through the roof and we've seen how often Ireland games in England have gone in the past with different competitions and you do hope that they can kick on and, you know, have a very good tournament. But the, the duality is a, of it is, you know, I, I think... The fifth place game that she lost was actually to Australia in Ravenhill. So there's almost an element of opening the book, closing the book in, in that regard. That was probably unfortunate as a squad. Do you think he do you think he recovered from it quickly? I know, you know, the, the whole thing of the World Cup is there's so long between games, but come the following year and it's back into the Six Nations, do you think he he fully dusted it off or or how did you go about addressing it? No, no way. I don't think it's, I think we, we lost the fifth place playoff, but we lost the following game versus Wales. Again, a team that we like completely had the beatings of. We obviously also had the beatings of Australia because we'd beaten them earlier in the tournament. But at that stage, like I said, you know, it, it, it was things had gone really, gone really badly for us and it was really took its toll on the squad. But losing the eighth place playoff to Wales meant we missed out on qualification for the following World Cup. That was the last. Wales got the last qualification spot. That Losing that game, we're still paying the price of losing that game. That's still why we... That's Losing that game is the reason why we are where we are now. Who knows what could have gone on, but at least we would have qualified for the last World Cup at least there would have been at least things would have been different and i don't imagine that they'd be any worse than they than they got to um again we're you know we're on a rise now so i won't say where things are currently but we're not we're not too far away from it um i don't think we'll uh, no we we never recovered from that or uh Maybe we were able to kind of push it out of our minds. We definitely have. No one talks about the World Cup. Nobody ever mentions it. I went to the World Cup in New Zealand um, for many reasons. I think everyone was trying to pretend it wasn't actually happening. But I went and uh, uh, to not have Ireland there was pretty unbelievable, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't think, I think we still never, I think we never recovered or maybe never will recover from that World Cup. Yeah, it's mad to think because the, the term you use is you had the beatings of Wales and France. And I think the 2021 qualifiers, I know the World Cup's in 2022, so just bear with me if I say 21, mm -hmm. but the qualifiers for those game for that World Cup against Italy, who they beat Scotland and Spain, again, they had the beating of them. And I suppose that's probably an entirely different feel. Like he, some players will come on and say they'd rather lose by 30 points than lose by one or two. And, and that's their prerogative. That's what they feel. But like to know you probably have a team you can beat and should beat and don't is probably an entirely different feeling, especially in like 
a straight qualification shootout like that because we're not used to qualification in in rugby. No, and no, especially if we look at you know the the men's side of things, and you look back and you see kind of Spain and Portugal and them those teams like going through a qualification and like you know likes of Chile and stuff like you know Ireland men's team has never had to to be you know that that uh, that low or considered that low, but um, the the qualification like. T- it just goes to show, you know, when you're saying, oh, we have the beatings up, it just goes to show that the 80 minutes is only a snapshot of how a team is performing. Because, yes, you perform on the pitch, but also how are you performing in training, off training? Are you sleeping? Are you eating? Are you happy? Are you not? Does the team click? Are the team happy? Do the management and team get on? Are the management happy? Like... The 80 minutes is only, you know, everyone thinks that, oh, you know, you turn up and you should win or you should lose or you should win by however much. Like the 80 minutes is only a snapshot of how your whole week went. So, you know, uh, it's, you know, it's all well and good saying on paper who should be winning. Like, I mean, Ireland men's team is complete proof of that where, you know, going into the, the, World Cup is world number one and still still achieving just as much as we did every other time, no matter what our ranking was then. Yeah, no, it's it's true. And I don't want to jump too far ahead um, until your kind of later days with Ireland and, and subsequent retirement because quite a lot happened in between. You mentioned going to England and you played for Richmond. Okay, fair enough, Richmond. No one plays, not a known rugby team. But Harlequins and Gloucester, Hartbury two of the most well-known and most successful teams in, in the English Premiership. What was it like playing for those? Because we, we don't hear about it too often as much as there are plenty of Irish players over there. We don't hear about it too often. So what was it like playing at Quinns and then subsequently Gloucester? Um, so when I went to Richmond first, things were very kind of similar to how they were at home. By the time I'd moved to Harlequins, um things had ramped up in terms of like investment in the premiership. So um, what was, what was possible was uh, for players who, who were playing for a premiership club um, training in the afternoons, which is ironically what I used to have when I was in the Bowes Academy, but this was kind of across the whole team. If you had availability and if you could train in the afternoons, that was a big, you know, I just kind of access to extra training was a really like really enjoyable because you've smaller numbers. You're not just going through kind of gameplay stuff. You're actually like really like individually getting to work on your skills. And, you know, if, if you, you know, if you look at your stats from the weekend and you saw that you, you know, missed a number of tackles, you could go to a coach and not just like in the 10 minutes before we start training, this was like, you know, a full hour. Then you kind of kind of like reassess it again and go back to the same coach and like just more individual, individualized, specialized, you know, professional setup. And the reason that was possible is because the RFU, you know, the, the, the English equivalent of the IRFU, they they basically had a, you know, they were the stakeholders of the premiership. So what it meant to be a team in the premiership, um, it meant you had to have the facilities to facilitate and provide a full-time training program for an English player who was contracted to England. So, you know, just taking like, I don't know, Shauna Brown, for example, you know, She's employed now by the RFU, but instead of, you know, bringing her to camp and having her just live with all the English players all the time, she gets to play with her club, who the RFU trusts because Harlequins have put forward, you know, a, um, what do you call it? Like, you know, one of those, oh, there's a word for it, like an application where you can say, yes, we can provide Shauna Brown, for example, with A, B, C, gym, physio, um, uh, specialized coaching, um, stats, GPS, da, 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 da. that's what all the premiership clubs had to have for their players so that when a player becomes contracted by the RFU, they 
trust the clubs to run that program f- on behalf of the RFU. What that meant for someone like me then was that if I could arrange my working schedule, because I have to work, there's there's no, I'm not, the clubs don't give professional contracts. Um, they have eventually started to give like uh, small fees for, for, for players, just as kind of basically as ways of like getting players to come and play for you which would mean that sometimes you might not have to work on a Friday afternoon or something like that. So you can, I personally was able to like alter my work part time and, and work less than a full-time schedule so that I could make the Tuesday afternoon gym session, conditioning session, whatever it was. That was, uh, that's when things really started to kind of uh, kick on for, for, for English premiership. And it's kicked on to a great entity. I know it's been, rebranded since and you can always you know say that is that good but that's an entirely different conversation but it's it's a very strong league it's a very competitive league I know Quinns have been a real competitor there in recent years Saracens have kicked on as well and both both of whom have had a number of Irish players down through the years but I, I know I don't have a mention but I talked about this with um Alex McHenry and with Sean Plain and with Johnny Holland and uh, loads of others when you move there and you're playing in this uh, I suppose you'd play consistently with UL Bowls, but as well, you're playing consistently with Quinns or with Gloucester or whoever. How important mm-hmm. were those minutes? Because as much as the IL was, was strong, if you're playing at Harlequins or at Gloucester, you're playing against England internationals the whole time. And when you're at Gloucester, England had become the number one side in the world. Mm. Yeah, you needed to uh, do a lot of kind of homework on the opposition players because, well, number one, you know, we had a lot of English players in the squad ourselves and they would, they'd know a lot about the opposition players and know what kind of, what gets under their skin or uh, what how to deal with them. So it was a lot of homework. But again, that comes down to the extra kind of time you have together in your training centre, etc. But, um, you know, it, it was consistently really, really difficult games like from week to week. Whereas with Bowes, it would have been, uh, you know, a really strong match coming up in maybe a couple of weekends' time and then a few ones that you kind of had to get to. Like, don't get me wrong, that happened in the Prem as well, but it was just kind of more consistently a higher level. And, uh, yeah, physically, physically, there would have been a lot of kicking as well. So often there weren't as many tackles as you might have been making for UL Bowes, for example. So, um, you know, I never, I never kind of... And I suppose it's because how I was growing through the game as well. And just as a player, I never stood back and was like, wow, you know, I can really feel the difference in the league. Like some of the most difficult games I played were in um, Richmond when we kind of in my first couple of years there, maybe it would have been 2015 when we won the premiership with Richmond. And uh, some of the games against Saracens were so tough because I think players were getting really stronger and the kicking game hadn't really come in then as well so like that one of two one or two of those games at Richmond would have been similar to like some of the level with UL Bowes were afterwards you're like I am dead like I am absolutely like the tank is emptied like some of those games were just brilliant I never I don't know what did I feel like it was uh did it change but I think from a playing perspective you're always giving like 100% anyway I never yeah. felt like oh now I feel like it's gotten so much harder now by the time I got to Gloucester or anything like that yeah. no I, I understand what you mean and while you were there you got selected for the Barbarians as well it's like Barbarians storied history but a women's team has only been around for for less than a decade can you just describe that that honor of getting a chance to play for them but also because it's such a big part of the Barbarians' history, the week of it and how that whole come together as a squad, what all, what's all that like? It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Like, I actually was just um, chatting to someone about this there recently, and I was just like, sharing the pitch with people from different countries and rugby cultures is just such a privilege. And, you know, I know that can happen in your club and a lot of, you know... A lot of men's teams would, but it's not celebrated like it is in in um in the barbarians. Um, some crack. Oh, it's just some crack. Like you go for the crack, so everyone's prepared just to have the crack. Like so, um, the 
it's very open minded. It's very much kind of honeymoon rugby where you're like, you know, you don't need to get to know the bad sides of of a player. You don't need to get to know what a player what are her downsides or anything like that because it's literally just all about the positive the positivity throughout the week um yeah you go out for dinner go out for drinks you can't train too hard because you're playing on the saturday so you know you just you just kind of like get together like come up with names for stuff like it also depends on you know what coach you have like i had um um rachel taylor and joe um oh my god what's her surname she literally just moved she, former Worcester Warriors coach she literally just Joe Yap um she just got the Australian head coach job um that was a privilege they were just so relaxed and like trusted the players and were just facilitated the crack and like the individuality of players but like two of the best days of my life were playing for barbarians both times like the I was invited to barbarians quite a few times and I wasn't able to make it for various different reasons and, uh, you know, I was invited to Colorado to play. I was invited somewhere else, like these really nice places. And then eventually when I was able to say yes, I, like I told my family, like, oh, I finally was able to say yes to Barbarians. I'm going to pay for play. And they were like, oh, my God, where is it going to be? You know, thinking it was going to be somewhere like amazing. And I was like, it's going to be in Cardiff. And I was so <laughs> happy because I flip and love Cardiff. Like, I, it couldn't have been in a better city for me that first game of barbarians because i just carried it for me is just one of the best rugby cities in the whole world and like as a monster fan you know yeah. no nowhere is better than cardiff so like playing for cardiff or playing for cardiff playing in cardiff for the barbarians was unbelievable and then what happened the second time was the men's game was cancelled so we took the main slot and that oh, was yes. just incredible because like <laughs> i didn't really work i didn't really work it out in my head but like we were told that week was slightly different because we didn't get to spend time with the men's barbarians, which was really fun the last time, you know, just like got to, you know, sit next to Matthew Bastereau and talk to him about rugby, you know, like, and I, where there's like mutual respect because you're both playing for the barbarians. Um, the second time we didn't get to see the men's team at all. Uh, but you know, it didn't matter. We had an, an amazing time amongst ourselves anyway, but uh when the men's game was called off, like we were waiting, we just had our breakfast and this message came in and they were like, um, you're going to have to have your pre-match meal um, at 10 o'clock. And we, this was like nine o'clock. We're like, we're just after eating breakfast. Like uh, one of the worst things about high performance rugby is the pre-match meal. Honestly, like when they came in and told us that we were like, oh my God, like what's going on? They said, we might have to play earlier than scheduled because we think that the men's game is off. And we were like, oh my god like that is crazy so we were eating our pre-match meal but we still hadn't it confirmed as to whether we were gonna go or not like because we were waiting in the hotel next thing this message came in like bang okay go like oh we all had to order ubers to get to Twickenham Stadium because we'd no bus the bus wasn't coming till later and uh got like sitting in the traffic like myself and I was with Lindsay Pete and in, in, in the Uber and um one of the Canadian players and like we were just having some crack like listening to music and asking your man to turn up the music. You know, you usually get to go on a bus. But it was just the three of us in the in the Uber. And it was only when we were on the way to the stadium that it clicked in my head. Oh my God, there's fifty thousand people on the way to the stadium. I it, didn't dawn on me until we were in the uber and i was like oh my god now they it, they lost a couple of thousand people just didn't bother going then because they were obviously only going to see the men but uh funnily enough i was in um which is the reason why i live in la rochelle now actually i just came to la rochelle on a when we had a weekend off from a game with with uh gloucester we came to la rochelle for the weekend and i met this guy in the pub I was like, whoa, wow, you play women's rugby. He was like, 
I saw a game of women's rugby once. He was like, I have to admit, it, it was a bit of an accident, but I went to Twickenham to watch the men play, but the men's game was cancelled and the women played instead. And I was like, Jesus, is that right? Go on. <laughs> Tell me all about it. Like, he was talking all about it, how much he thought it was a brilliant game. And I was like, oh, I actually played number eight that day. He nearly fell off the stool. Poor Ted. God rest his soul. No, I'm joking. <laughs> he didn't die. <laughs> he didn't die. But uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was one of the best. Both times I played for Barbarians were like two of the best days of my life. That's that's absolutely class because you do hear occasionally about the Barbarian stories. And I remember, I think it must be two years ago now that Raj did an interview with Jim Hamilton while he was involved with the Barbarians. And you just got a peek inside the curtain. And it did look like great fun or whatever, but you never really truly know. So like, it's, all, it's always good to hear it as well. And, you know, the fact that you were one of the first bunch to do it as well is, is special as well. And to do it, to them enough not a full house but close to a full house is is pretty cool but to bring things slightly back down to earth you you retired from the international game back in 2022 uh, admittedly things haven't been going great for Ireland in the last you know three to four years or, or whatever although I shouldn't say four years because they had a good six nations in 2020 or 2021 the one that was held in, in Cardiff but you know how much did the failure to qualify for the World Cup lead into the decision and I mean that in the fact that you know, sometimes players will look at the World Cup as being where they close the book. So, like, how much is that in in the decision? Um, to be honest, it didn't have anything to do with my decision. Um, the change in management uh, is what what uh, forced my hand. I I feel um, just uh, I'd gone through kind of a, a you know very tough World Cup. Um, I'd had tough days with um, the newer management that took over from uh, uh, from Tom's era, and then it looked as if looked as if it was it was the it was going to be the same. I was going to go through the same uh, pattern as what had been as what, what just as just how my career went for me. Unfortunately, just. You know, playing really well and dropped, left out of the squad, left out of training, like not invited back, and then coming back and 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 playing really well, but getting dropped again anyway. Just whatever it was, it just was. I had just really bad um, kind of roller coaster. You know, the number the number sixteen. I just I can't, I still can't believe that I only have sixteen caps. Like I feel like, you know, I definitely feel like I would have and should have had way more, but. I can't believe it's only 16 because I was in the squad since I was so young on the fringes yeah. of the squad as well. And, and, you know, in actually training in the squad for, for so many years and, um, you know, and sevens was, you know, uh, part of that as well, but that was fine. Like it was just the way that was at the time, balancing the sevens and fifteens. And if you went into fifteens, it might've been taken across to sevens and it might mean you missed out on some fifteens opportunities, but, you know, I did get to play on the world series for sevens as well, but, just generally by the time that you know the, the new coach came in and called me up and was like no you're not invited I just sort of like I can't I can't um no I can't do it to myself anymore it was very tough you know mentally and affected me a lot and I just I wasn't myself I couldn't be myself and I couldn't you know, after all the years of, you know, wanting to play for Ireland, I just don't think it's worth it if you can't be yourself. Like, what is the point in, you know, making your family proud and yourself proud and your club and your province if you can't be the best version of yourself? It just, you know, it doesn't, that doesn't make any sense to me. And I get that you have to go through tough times. Don't get me wrong. Like, it's tough to play for your country, but kind of self-worth and self-value, like, constantly be you know that could affect you for a long time and it has affected me for a long time it still affects me so I just decided that I couldn't put myself through another cycle of that because you know often it would be like I'll just go back to my club and I'll play hard and I'll at least you go back to your club and you get to play and prove to yourself and your club that you know you, you are in the right place and you you are doing the right thing I just uh I wasn't um I wasn't prepared to do it to myself any longer Fair. Um, just just on that because, and you know, it's kind of a, there's a right way to go around this, but like players of your age bracket, um, or players in England, or players maybe outside of Leinster, but ripping up trees for for Munster or Connacht, 
were so often overlooked? I know you can't answer for everyone else, but do you feel like there's a, a sense of feeling let down by coaches or, or by whoever, the fact that a lot of players and yourself included in this were kind of pushed out of the way very quickly and it never felt like a natural evolution of the squad. It literally just went from being a prime age squad to being a very young one. And do you think there's an element of like, well, I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth, but kind of like fuck them, you know, because like it doesn't, it never felt natural. I think, I think what it seems like and whether I'm right or wrong about this, but I felt like there was a fear of the more experienced players. Um, That's what it felt like, whether that's true or not. And whether, you know, we were genuinely not as good as these young, fresh players that have, you know, uh, burst on the scene. Um, it, 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 it felt that way. It felt like, um, they were just scared of, of players with experience and players who, who'd, you know, ask, ask questions. And that's, that's how, that's how I felt a lot of the time. And I do think that like, God, like the younger players were brilliant and they are so brilliant, but like, you need, uh, you need experience in, in, in your squad. And yeah, a lot of the experience was a lot over the years. You're right. It, it's not just me or it's not just, you know, one or two. It happened a, a lot that, the experienced players just, you know, were not just phased out. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. But you need that experience, like for for the younger players as well, to like be under studies of senior players and not achieve things too quickly. And um, you know, a lot of them have done like so brilliantly. But in terms of like experience in the squad, I just, you know, sitting at home. Again, sitting at home, like, and I sat at home and watched a lot of this going on with my with my teammates who were out, you know, playing while I just, you know, was on my couch. But on my couch with my journey from starting at under 17, like monster underage, monster seniors, like coming through the AIL, playing in the UK, playing in all these places and all the things I learned and all the time I put into like biding my time the things I learned in the Irish jersey, the things I learned while fighting for the Irish jersey, to have all of that sitting at home, including the World Cup, sitting on my couch at home with me, watching us fail to qualify for a World Cup. That was hard. I I got messages saying that. I cannot believe you're at home watching this. And not, you know, not to take away from any player in my position or I like, you know, it's just, um, and it's not just me again. It was like a lot of experience that could have been so valuable in the Irish squad in the last number of years just wasn't, um, wasn't used. The experience of, of, of players has been undervalued. So what I hope for the, you know, the current squad is that, and it's hard because you have like changes in management all the time as well. But the girls who are getting their first caps now, they need to still be there in five, six, seven years time. They need to be in the squad till they're over 30. And like, obviously, you know, injuries, retirements, whatever, but not, and things naturally happen. But they need what they're going through now needs to be on the pitch in the Irish jersey in five, six years. However, as long as we can keep that experience on the pitch with them. Absolutely. Do you feel like, and I'll, I'll move off after this, do you feel like how you feel in that sentiment is shared amongst other players in the same position? Because I don't want to get into names because that would be extremely unfair. But there are other players who are who are mentioned the whole time, will say, as being, why aren't they involved? And they're playing one in the Premiership or, or wherever. Do you feel hmm. like they feel the same way as you? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think they do. Well, why, why, why wouldn't they? Why, you know, it's understandable why people ask that. It's the same reason that I'm saying like the, the experience, not just the ability, because the ability is, is clearly there, but coaches don't always, you know, pick on ability either. Coaches will pick, you know, for whatever reason. And there have been questions around certain players and the coach will always give an answer, or, you know, which is kind of like, okay, fair enough. You, you're allowed to say those things, but like, uh, 
in terms of like missing experience, especially for where this Irish squad is, is um, yeah, maybe maybe they do feel the same again. I I can't speak for anyone else, and I always try to be as honest as possible, which is difficult because you don't want to. I don't I don't like to to criticize. It's just the way that it's gone. It's just there's definitely been mistakes made. It's been admitted that there have been mistakes made. It's about going forward now, but we can't move forward. Um, unless we're really honest about what's happened. And I, I just I try to be as honest as I can when I give answers, which isn't always easy either. No, it's it's completely understandable because as well as that, there's, you know, some people will, I, you know, people who may not understand it will just throw the party line and say the same thing. And some people will be involved in the game. And I know a lot of people involved in, in the women's side of the game at AIL level will have very strong feelings on the, on, you know, selection, for instance, as well. And that's, but that's where we need to be, where it's an actual conversation. You know, that, that's that's my opinion. As I said, you know, throwing out sevens on national media as being like the 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 stock and horse over it all, like that's not doing it any good. You know, it's not doing the likes of yourself any favors. Yeah, but but you're right as well in terms of having the the conversations. Like this, the conversations need to happen. Like fair play to the journalists who are asking the questions, um, because you know if if there were you know very clear strange omissions in the Irish squad you can rest assured there'd be conversations on every platform about it but there's nowhere to hide kind of in the men's uh, side of things you have to be very transparent about you know what what you do whereas that that doesn't exist in in the women's game just yet at least on Ireland yeah absolutely well I will naturally move on to the the Guinness women's six nations I suppose I should if I'm a media outlet, I kind of have to give it a, the title sponsor and everything. But that kicks off on Saturday as, as this goes out. Maybe not as we record, but we get over that. Ireland did finish sixth last year. The lowest finish since 2002 with this, the new head coach in there and Scott Beeman. I need to get used to saying that. Um, how do you see Ireland going this year under, under his stewardship? Uh, I think it's going to be tough. Um, I don't think there'll be a huge change from... Uh, last year in terms of like kind of how different squads have have developed so I think it'll be again very very tough you know you're looking to beat Scotland beat Italy definitely definitely doable I thought Italy and Scotland played really well in the WXV2 Um, but you know that doesn't always mean uh, that you know they're going to hold on to the same form, or they're 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 going to be miles better than Ireland. Ireland were also good in in WXV three, so um, uh, it's uh, I you know I'm always positive about these things. I always feel like you know all you because teams can achieve things like very strangely at any any time, any underdog, any kind of. Uh, minnows you know can like achieve something like so that's that's what i'm that's what i'm hopeful for for this irish squad because uh you know they're they're getting together again you know like they're in their clubs in the provinces celtic challenge cup i feel like the 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 celtic cup last year didn't do ireland any favors in terms of preparation where they felt they were very strong after winning all their games in the Celtic Challenge and then the level of Six Nations was so much more above them. So they're wiser this year. Um, they've more had more time together throughout WXV and they've got together already, you know, a, a number of weeks in advance of the tournament. Um, so I, I'm... I feel like Ireland, if, if, they can, if things can click for them and they've, you know, they've got the right balance, you know, which they... They already showed in WXV two, WXV three, you know that that uh, you know they achieved something. I was really glad for them to have like just achieved something, like winning something, and lifting a, a trophy in the air was like really nice to see. But again, they know they have to be better. So I don't think they'll be sitting on their laurels like, oh great, we won the WXV three and now we're winning Cal- games in the Celtic Challenge Cup. Like I think that naivety is gone. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm hopeful for kind of a bigger bigger step up. And the new the new head coach Scott, like he would have worked with the the Red Roses in England, and we we might touch on England in a minute because it goes without saying how dominant they've been. But do you know much about him, or uh, do you think there's anything we can expect differently from Ireland, or even their their other coaches? Because I know like Dennis Fogarty's in there, Larissa Muldoon is in there in some capacity. There's 
some quite well-known names in the coaching ticket. Yeah, um, it's nice to see him, you know, like change things up. And I admired his selection of uh, Sam and Tricky as co-captains. Um, you know, it's not exactly, and he's named them as co-captains again for the Six Nations. That's not very, uh, you know, it's a bit against the grain, you know, just have picked two captains and two in the forwards. And I think it's definitely the right choice. Um, so I was really happy to see that, you know, he's shaken things up, which means he wasn't just happy to just come in and just get on with things. He was like, no, I want to do things my way. So, um, yeah, let's see. I know that, um, you know, Dennis, very popular man in there. And like, they, they really, they really admire him and he does a lot of great work with them. So, um, interested, you know, to see Larissa, like how, how she'll get on and, you know, she's not long out of the squad herself, but she's got a lot of coaching experience under her belt now as well. So, uh yeah let's um i don't i don't know do like in, in your in terms of like to answer your question about scott there's i don't know a lot about him even like the english girls i would have asked a few of the girls who were kind of on the fringes and they said uh yeah some people really liked him some people didn't i was like well same as every other coach then you know so uh yeah uh who knows this the six nations will again kind of, there's nowhere to hide when we get to the six nations and like especially now that there's the separate window to the men's and there's so much more you know ramped up kind of like coverage and stuff uh there's a uh, you know let's see let's put them to the test now absolutely and you do have experience of, of playing with and against some of the english players some of the french players you know you're living over there now and england i, I have no shame in saying it. i don't show for england in many things but I did kind of want to see them win the World Cup um, final down in New Zealand, but that's just because I like a bit of history and like a bit of romance. But like, listen, we got one of the great World Rugby games. Never mind World Cup games. We got one of the great games. They didn't manage to do it, but they will be favourites. France will be favourites. Who do you see coming out between the two of them? I think the the matchup is in France this year. Yeah, they, they'll be playing in France this year. Um, who do you see coming up between the two of them and is there anyone we should be watching out for um, going back to your you know the, the game of the World Cup final I'm still shook from that by the way I was there I was with like all uh, my English pals and I have to agree with you I I wanted England to win I have a lot of friends who, who play for England and you know I saw how how hard they worked you know in preparation for the tournament but also the program and what they've created in England, I really felt like they were going to be, we were going to be able to say, okay, yeah, this is what works. Now we know that this is what works. Like, you know, New Zealand rugby are not renowned for their support and organization and structure of women's rugby. So to have them win, I was like, Oh God, like it just proves how amazing that team is. And I actually met a, a Joanna recently, who's the girl who stole that last line out. And I was like, that was you. I was like, I've had nightmares about you. <laughs> like, uh, which is what an amazing player. Like, there's so much talent down there, and they're kind of finally trying to get things going down there. But I wanted England's England, not only the girls to win, but the the formula that they've produced to be like, okay, this is the formula that works now. Can everybody else follow suit? Um, in terms of how they're going to play this year, oh, like you still have. You know, like Marley Packer is still in there, like still one of their best players. Like, what an engine! Like, what an absolute performer! Like, the you know the, the given like the 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 back row talent that's coming through in England and like in the Premiership, the fact that she's like still there, just like hammering away. She's so phenomenal. Um, I actually I haven't looked at the 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 squad, the training squad that's been released. Um, so. I'm presuming there's uh, kind of same as ever. Like there's so many the, in in the Premiership. You also need a center of excellence in each of your um, uh, Premiership clubs. You know, for, for the young kind of under twenties girls and some of the girls that have come through that and through the under twenties uh, setup, they'll get a run around as well because you know England is so strong that they can kind of like stretch their squad and give give girls you know, a, a bit of a run around, especially not in the World Cup year. You know, they don't need to be playing their full strength like all the time. So uh, they'll be interesting to watch. Like there's still, you know, young front rows in there that are like racking up caps like all the time and they're still only in their early 20s, you know. So, um, 
Yeah, and I think it's Ireland versus uh, England in Twickenham, and England are going for a sellout game. Uh, or they 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 want to they want to create a record crowd for that game, Ireland versus England in Twickenham. Like that's going to be huge. Um, and I hope Ireland are up for it, and I hope that uh, it'll be a really good game of rugby. When you look at France, then um, I think I think England will will. I think England will will beat them, um, no problem. Like they're they're very good, and my goodness, they were like a kick away from getting to the World Cup final ahead of New Zealand. Um, fantastic players, but I know that they've kind of had changes again in their management and stuff, and uh, players out and players in, so it's not so such smooth sailing in in France either. But uh, I I yeah, I predict a kind of an England taking first place, France taking second place. Uh, okay, that I could that would probably be my prediction coming in, um, as well. So at least I know I'm on steady ground um, to compare myself against. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just on Ireland, you mentioned the key games being against Italy and Scotland. They have those at home, um, in Ravenhill and the RDS respectively. I'm pretty sure I don't know which one is which. If you were to put a number on it, where do you think Ireland will finish? I hate these questions. <laughs> That's why it's not a win. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I'm, I'm like I'm almost saying like if if I'm obviously going for an Irish victory, I feel like they could beat Scotland. And in the same breath, I feel like sure if you're going to beat Scotland, you have the beatings of Italy as well. Um, so uh, whether they could beat Wales, Wales have put a lot into their full-time program as well and like they're just massive girls uh, and I mean that in like the best way possible like they're they're fit they're strong they're like they're all full-time now like they're playing really well they played in WXV1 um I think beating Wales would be uh maybe maybe this time around a bridge too far but I'll, I'll, I'll back the girls to to get victories against uh Scotland and and, and Italy um, where would that leave them? Fourth, fourth. More than likely, it could be very competitive, and you could get absolutely shafted even with two wins. But hope, hopefully, it doesn't end Thank up you. that way. Yeah. Um, one last question because I've held you long enough. So, just one last one. Your former Ireland and UL Bowes County Keir Griffin came out of retirement out of the blue a couple of weeks ago. Is there any chance we'll see the two of you in the UL Bowes back row going forward, or is that just like not happening? Because you you played your last game for Ireland on the same night as well. Quit. Not by design, but is there any chance we'll see it? Gas, I'd absolutely love to play with her again. Um, I'll never forget like one moment, one moment playing for Munster above in the sports ground. I can't remember what year, and she was playing six and I was playing eight. And I just said to her, like, you chop, I'll poach. And literally, next up, she just flies off the scrum. Bang, I'm over the ball. We won the penalty. She just jumps up. And we were just like, yes. Like, we made such a good team. I absolutely loved playing with her. Um, <laughs> I'd love to play again for UL Bowes. The only thing is I don't see myself returning to Ireland before the end of my playing days. But it's not out of the question either. I actually, you know, I'm playing in France at the moment, I'm playing Division 2. I kind of felt like, and, you know, just kind of stepping away from Ireland, I felt like I was, you know, winding down uh, on, you know, kind of my, uh, how much I wanted to play. But actually, I'm kind of as hungry as ever. And actually, I'm, 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 I have a few kind of thoughts in my mind about what I might do next year, like what I continue here in La Rochelle, you know, I know where we're trying to get promoted to the first division, but the the it's very complex this year, so it it it's it's a huge task for this year. Or or would I, you know, go for another year in the Prem, uh, another year in the AIL? Like it actually, it's not a, it's not out of the question, definitely. So uh, I don't know if if Junior, uh, we call her Junior, Kira Griffin. I don't know if Junior would uh, still be around and wait for me to come back for you elbows. She's uh, she's busy farming, so uh, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Uh, we'll uh, I wouldn't put any money on it just yet, but uh, <laughs> keep watch this space. <laughs>
you, you never know. You just never know with sport. But I, I will leave it at that, Anna, because I've kept you on for enough of your day. But thank you very much for coming on. It's been a treat to not only talk about your career, but Irish women's rugby in general. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Kaylon. I'll talk to you soon. And for everyone at home, this is the notable episode of what has been a great series so far with plenty of interviews and the interviews will keep coming this week along with podcasts looking at the women's game in Ireland and the upcoming Six Nations, which, as I said, kicks off on Saturday. So thanks home to everyone for listening. If you like what you see or hear, please do subscribe and you'll find the the links for my channels below. Hope you enjoyed this episode. But for now and until next time, take it easy.